No. And then he's a really nice guy. We need to talk to him. He's really, really in turn, inside the bank are mm. allies. I had a really, mm. really great chat with him yesterday. Lots of ideas, lots of positive talk. So you need to, we need to keep him friendly because he's an ally inside the bank. Oh, gosh, he doesn't come into India. When he's not coming to India, yeah, I wonder if he's interested. I know, I'm really, it's a real shame he's not coming to India. But, so, see so he's you can, not going to speak to him here? He's going to speak here. Oh, okay. But okay. he is not allowed to mention that he's there. Yeah. So, um, he, I did say, will you go get a lie and you just anything? And he's just, yeah. which shows how controversial it is. Yeah. How upset they are. No, so, I mean. Um, but, I, but I don't get a feeling that he's going to be attacked. Yeah, but you see the problem, uh, part of the problem is also I think the AFDP is, is, is giving the, that environment, it's creating that environment. Well, so, I think people can express that and he, I think maybe we'll just say that he's here to listen, maybe that's yeah. the yeah, yeah, yeah. Than to, to talk because unfortunately the bank hasn't. Yeah. Isn't currently in a position to talk about it, mm. but in there he is. Mm. I don't want to interrupt the live broadcast is starting. Okay. But only if we put on the, the mic. That's right. right. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. And this, was this yours? That's me. So no, no, I just want to get rid of anything. No, no, it's um, fine. And I'll make sure this is clear. Perfect. So I'm going to text it and you should be fine. If not, I'll alert you. Okay. No problem. Uh, and please, mental notes. So the, the Google Chrome yeah. cannot be closed. So if anybody goes to put another PowerPoint up there, it wouldn't shut. You cannot touch the Google Chrome because it will interrupt your live broadcast. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry for interrupting. No worries. No worries. <laughs> we need to get started. We do need to know where is our audience? Go see your events and go out. Can I, can I just call the ones who are out here? Yeah. Get them in here, make it look like an event. <laughs> but we, they are five minutes, so don't worry. Yeah. I've set a reminder. Oh, you set a reminder. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so I've not got I've not got name plates, but I have got a slide that um, with, with, uh, the, with the names on that I need to. Uh, the one when we started, I'll move it on. Uh, I'll, I'll put that so just a list of names rather rather than the name. Okay, maybe I'll leave it there. Although I do need to. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, we have quite a number of guys that we've already confirmed they good in our events. Good. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think we have three people already. Yeah. So, and some kind of so and then a number of side like meetings with them as well. Good. Yeah. Good. 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 And the method is the director of the Yeah, we want to Ah, yes, 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 y
So I don't, I said to my family that I don't have time for everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I asked you to Ah, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So I give that to that teacher. So I'll give that to another teacher. Okay, great. Yeah. Very good, Vincent. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Pleasure meeting you. Is Stefan here? So what are you doing? I saw the guy. He's supposed to be speaking on the panel. Um, no? Do you have his number? Can you get it? No, I'm not going to go. Obviously, it lacks a compliance market, which was an add on, and that's what got kind of the of traders and so on. Yes, and they had a I mean, I, although that's the sector that I work in, the, these days I'm not very comfortable with that. And then you shouldn't be making no. additional returns. <laughs> yes. The speculators in London should be making a profit on the, yes. on the crook stove project yes. in yes. yes. Um, so um, uh, I think uh, I don't mind if we don't necessarily have a compliance market as a limitation. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that if you know if we have donors and impact investors, if they're looking at this, and maybe even CSR buyers, mm -hmm. who I think would be more interested now at least days in saying yes you know we felt households adapt to climate change instead of saying oh you know we've taken you know a thousand emission reduction we lost a lot of travel and i think it's a much nicer story than it's said that we're actually helping households um, and uh, you know that, that, that through a, a mechanism like the allocation of capital yeah, um, no one's not come arrived at as you say either him or robert well, Moore are meant to be here and on the panel Text him and see if it's him or, or uh, just say, Is it you or Robert's coming? We're about to start. Something like that. Robert. <laughs> they name's Robert Moore. Rob Moore. Oh, 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 he's a climate Hello, Stephen. Nice to meet you again. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Stephen's from Plant Action Network. Hi, Elizabeth. Where do you want me to sit? I don't mind. Sure. I'm not really pressured. Where are you sitting there? Well, yeah. well, yeah. We need one more. Uh, if we get um, sides, is, yeah. is this that? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. If you can sit again, because you need to operate, I'll put your PowerPoint up, okay. uh, and that's the only place you can operate the PowerPoint from. So if you can, thank you for uh, yes. for uh, you doing this. Should just need you guys to get on the roll. So, <laughs> um, we just picked the UK representative, and I'm with Beth. Hopefully, if not wrong, um, Rob Moore is our backup. <coughs> We'll start in just two minutes.
Just like you know, to know. Is this no, you're going to find it. Right? Okay. Oh. In two minutes, if you start. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm going to um, start the interview with broadcast. Okay, I think we will get started. We have one of our speakers, um, Pete Betts um, or Rob Moore from the, the UK government, but I, I think they'll, they're busy negotiating, but I, they have promised that, that, that they'll attend. But I think because um, we're here and I'm being told that we're being broadcast to those in the UN networks, uh, the UNFCCC networks, so we're, we're being broadcast and they will um, be listening online. So I, th I think getting started is, is the thing to do. So uh, my name is Alison Doig. I'm head of policy at Christian Aid which is a UK international development agency that's been involved in the UNFCCC and climate change for a decade now, I'd say. And um, we have, with a number of our partners internationally, including PACHA, Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance, who are co-sponsors of the event, um, we're engaged in our Big Shift campaign, which is about shifting investments. That's public and private investments out of fossil fuel and into renewable energy, but also into energy access. So it's about sustainable energy access. So that's our context for coming here. The other co-sponsor is a Climate Action Network internationally, who are a, one of their key strategies at the moment is looking at international development fi finance institutes and looking at their role in, in delivering the Paris Agreement and the 1.5 objectives and the sustainable development goals. So just a very brief introduction to the, <coughs> the context for our event today, and then I'll move on swiftly to, to the panel. So um, basically to, to deliver the 1.5 degrees or even the two degrees, we know that trillions of dollars being planned to be spent on infrastructure and energy have to move, not just low carbon, but zero carbon. We're, we're having to move towards a zero carbon future. So that's, that's the challenge for the development banks. And in that context, you have 1.2 billion people without electricity, 3 billion people still cooking in an open fire every day. So it's a real scandal. And I think with the SDGs have really been marked um, energy as one of the key movers for delivering many of the SDGs, not just the energy one, but also, you know, in terms of small enterprise, in terms of um, medical care, education, energy is, is a central factor in that. And, and the um, development, finance, development finance institutions and the, the multilateral banks, the World Bank, the regional banks, but also things like export credits, and, and there's a number of ways in which development funds are spent, really can play a huge role in that and starting that. And hopefully we'll have some really exciting inputs in terms of the really positive developments that are going on today. But also they need to face up to the fact that their mainstream funding is still high carbon and that there's still investment in fossil fuels or, uh, or gas, but also oil and, and coal, um, different levels of, of funding in that. And, and really, um, we did as Christian Aid a study last year, which was looking at whether any of the multilateral banks and the regional banks were had a strategy to phase out or you know get their carbon footprint phased down and none of them really have a clear strategy for doing that in line with Paris so there's a challenge in how we do that as well so hopefully there'll be lots of really interesting positive solutions but it, for, for both those what are we going into but also how are we getting our carbon footprint down through our multilaterals and of course the engagement how the bank the multilaterals and the and the the development institutes uh, work with the climate finance is a big ask. How they leverage private finance is a big ask. So the, there's it's, this issue spreads out into many of the themes that people are interested in 
in the meeting here today. So um, moving on uh, to our panel. Um, so we have we have um, one, two, three, four, five speakers um, today. Um, we'll start with, with Gareth Phillips, who's from the Africa Development Bank, one of our the main regional development banks that are, are investing in energy and, and infrastructure continually. Um, we have Saeed uh, Chakri, who is speaking on half of um, Rachid Tahiri, um, the Moroccan NDA Secretariat to the GCF. So it brings in the climate finance element into there. Um, we'll either have Pete Betts or Robert Moore from the UK government um, giving that perspective of the, the donor side uh, to this. Um, th they channel much of the UK climate finance into via the multilateral banks. So it's it's a um, and the climate investment funds. So that's a, a key aspect. And then we have two CSO representatives, one from Africa. We have Mathika from the Pan African Climate Justice Alliance, and we have Stefan Singer from Can International. So we'll, we'll move on to the panel, and and um, we'll start with Gareth. Very good. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you, uh, Alison, for inviting me to come and uh, speak today. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, tell you a little bit about what the African Development Bank uh, is doing. Uh, I dare say you'll have heard that we adopted a new development agenda uh, when our new president took over almost two years ago. Uh, we call it the High Fives, and uh, we include in those uh, Light Up and Power Africa, Feed Africa, Integrate Africa, Industrialize Africa, and Improve the Livelihoods of African People. Um, and uh, to go with that, we uh, the board approved a new development and business delivery model, which uh, we are now in the process of implementing. And part of that uh, model is the creation of the department that I work in, uh, which is called Power, Energy, Climate and Green Growth. And uh, I, within that uh, department, uh, I'm currently uh, heading up the unit that is focusing on climate change and green growth with the objective of mainstreaming climate change and green growth into the bank's activities. And what I'd like to do is to tell you a little bit about some of the tools that we're currently using and that we're developing and how we're going to use those tools to help us uh, deliver on the 1.5 uh, degree target and the sustainable development goals. So there are two levels uh, that I'll talk briefly about. The first is our sort of um, macro level plan which is our country strategy papers and regional integration strategy papers, uh, which are five yearly exercises. Um, I recently worked on revising the guidelines that we have internally for, uh, for assisting uh, in these activities. And when they were written in 2012, it was quite interesting. The guidelines sort of suggested that the climate change team would go cap in hand to the country economist and ask him very nicely to consider including climate change in one or two of the pillars that uh, the strategy would focus on. Uh, in revising that guidance, I now see that the uh, really the boot is very much on the other foot and we're in a much stronger position to now go and tell the country economists that they must include climate change in the pillars because the national developments or the, uh, the nationally determined contributions and as soon as they're ready, the long-term emission strategies they must rank alongside national development priorities and strategies and uh, goals to create a middle-income country by 2030 and so on. And uh, if uh, and as soon as they're ready, they, they must also include the um, uh, plans and, and policies to achieve the sustainable development goals. So we're in a much, much stronger position now to tell our country economists uh, that when they design the, uh, the strategies, they must consider climate change uh, in the uh, in the development, so that's uh, that's at the sort of the at the high level, at the uh, the strategic planning level, and then we come down to the uh, the project level, and I'll just tell you briefly about some of the tools that we've developed and uh, and and are using uh, to ensure that our projects move forward and, and effectively mainstream climate change and green growth into their design. The first is what we call our climate safeguard screening tool, and the main purpose of this tool is to make sure that we don't build assets in places where they then get washed away by uh, rising sea level or uh, unexpected floods and so on. So typically that encourages us to build bigger drains and raise the level of, uh, of roads and build wider bridges and so on. I tend to think of that as really quite a very, uh, quite a narrow definition of adaptation. We're really kind of looking internally and saying we need to adapt our projects to make sure that they are resilient to future changes in the physical in, uh, climate. Um, and, and that's what we've been doing for the past few years. But as I say, I think that's a very narrow definition of adaptation and we need to broaden that out. So I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. The second tool that we have is our greenhouse gas accounting and reporting tool. 
And this uh, will encourage the task managers to enter estimates and, and, uh, and information that will result in estimates of greenhouse gas emissions from the construction and from the operation and maintenance of the assets that we build. Now, this is going to be an extremely interesting tool. It's, uh, I'm quite pleased with the design of it. We get a, uh, we get a one page printout uh, that can be annexed into a project appraisal report, which gives a, a sort of a nice picture of where the major of the major part of the emissions comes from. And so if, for example, you build a, a fossil fuel asset, you'll have a big black donut that will show um, the uh, all, all the emissions coming from uh, the construction of uh, sort of uh, and the operation of the asset. If you build a renewable energy plant, you'll have a green donut with a little thin black line on it, with the black line coming from the emissions associated with the construction and the green part associated with the renewable uh, energy aspect of it. So this will be a, a very interesting tool. It will also provide us with. Uh, or, or the, this graphic will highlight where the mitigation opportunities arise. So, for example, if we were doing an irrigation project, it might show that there was uh, emissions associated with pumping, uh, water pumping, and that would encourage us to say, what can we do to mitigate that? And the obvious solution is to look at solar pumps um, to, to mitigate those emissions. Uh, it will also provide us with a range of emission intensity data. Now, in the energy sector, that will be relatively easy to uh, to interpret. There will be tons of CO2 per megawatt hour. Uh, and the, you know, the important thing to look for would be to make sure that whatever asset we build lowers the average emission intensity for the generation fleet in the country concerned. So you might find a situation where you're building a gas-fired power plant uh, going into a, a coal-dominated grid or an oil-dominated grid, and that would... Uh, it, it, it's not it's not neutral, but at least it is reducing the greenhouse gas emissions, and it is helping put that country on a trajectory uh, towards lower greenhouse gas emissions in the future. Uh, it gets more complicated if we put that into the context of an agriculture project, because then you know you're comparing tons of lettuces with tons of potatoes, uh, and so you get very different values. But nevertheless, this will be interesting to start gathering this data. It will also give us data on the emission intensity of our investments, uh, what are our um, tons of CO to per million dollar loan and, and grant and so on. And I think that will be very interesting to start looking at that and perhaps uh, in, in the future comparing amongst different MDBs. It will also trigger a discussion. I think this is perhaps one of the most interesting parts. It's designed to trigger a discussion with our regional member countries to ask them, can you afford to take on the liability associated with this asset? Uh, and this is to highlight the fact that when we build an asset that contains an element of fossil fuels, you are locking in those emissions for the next 30, 40, or even 50 years. And uh, if you put that into the context of the long-term strategy to reduce emissions from where we are today to net zero sometime in the second half of the century, uh, you know, if you do a simple calculation and say you've got 50 years uh, to, uh, to reduce, then you might have an asset that, just for sake of, of calculation, emits 1% of your emissions today. Uh, well, in 25 years, when that asset is still going strong, it's going to represent 2% of the greenhouse gas emission or the greenhouse gas inventory if you take a straight line approach to sort of moving to zero. Now, this is a very simple calculation, but the point it's to make the point that uh, you know the uh, these assets that you build now will lock in these technologies and they will take up a proportion of your greenhouse gas emissions at a time when every other sector in the economy is also going to want to increase its emissions. You're going to have rising middle classes, uh, increased emissions from waste, from transport, increased industrial emissions. So can you really afford now to lock in an asset that is going to consume a significant proportion of your remaining greenhouse gas emission inventory? So I think that's going to be an extremely useful tool to help us highlight some of these issues. Briefly, uh, we also are developing uh, a tool that identifies the sort of human adaptation benefits, uh, recognizing how, for example, a clean cook stove project actually helps households and communities adapt to climate change by making them economically stronger. And that's interesting because we tend to think of cook stoves as a mitigation exercise, but actually for the families concerned, it's a massive adaptation benefit. So we want to get better at identifying the adaptation benefits associated with the, the projects that we build. 
And when we have both of these pieces of information about where we're doing mitigation, and where we're helping with adaptation, that will put us in a stronger position to seek climate finance from funds such as the Green Climate Fund. Um, so if we can make strong and compelling arguments to show how the projects that we're developing contribute to both mitigation and or adaptation, then we can make a strong case to go to the GCF for co-financing. And that's particularly important for the African Development Bank in, in, in the next few years, given uh, the low level of funding that we're expecting to get through the next round of the uh, ADF um, funds. Uh, the final tool that we use is a climate tracking, climate finance tracking tool, uh, which is developed uh, by the, um, uh, the joint MDBs. Uh, we have procedures, methodologies that we follow that help us identify when we've spent money or allocated money towards adaptation and or mitigation. And in the past, we've not been very good at doing that, and we've missed opportunities to highlight how much money we are actually investing uh, under climate finance. So we need to get better at doing that. Um, so those are uh, those are some of the tools that we're working on. Um, I'm now tasked with developing training and awareness and delivering that to our uh, into our sort of newly organised structure, uh, which I'll be doing uh, over this the, the remains of this quarter and next quarter. Uh, and hopefully we will get the resources that we need in terms of staff to work with our regional offices and our task managers to help them utilise these tools and start providing much more information. Uh, about our projects and helping them to have the discussions that we need to have with our regional member countries to make sure that they understand how these projects can or, or may not contribute towards uh, the 1.5 goal and achieving the SDGs. So I think I'll stop there. Alison, thank you very much. Thank you for uh, addressing the, the challenges I set at the beginning in such a positive way and I'm sure there'll be questions waiting for you um, but I think we'll go through each of our speakers first so, so hold your questions till, um, till then. So our next speaker um, is Saeed Chikiri who is speaking on, on behalf of, of Rachid Tahiri. Um, I'll pass over to you now just to, to introduce yourself. Thank you very much for uh, your invitation. I am Saeed Shakri from Morocco, but I uh, prepared my presentation in English, but I like speak French. <laughs> merci pour le, merci pour l'invitation. Merci aussi. Yes. Um, we don't have translation in the, in the room. I want. No, oh, here. it's in. Sorry. Mm. Yes, on the slides. On the slides. Slide. Slide. Okay. Sorry. In, on, in, pardon. Yeah. Okay. Donc, je vais présenter l'expérience marocaine en relation avec le défi sur surtout les énergies renouvelables et certaines recommandations. Ma présentation va comporter. Ah. Oui. Ah. Ma présentation va comporter à peu près euh, 8 points. Je vais parler dans un premier temps sur la vulnérabilité des Marocs face au changement climatique. Aussi, je vais parler un peu sur les indices au Maroc et l'opportunité d'investissement. La vision du Maroc aussi sur la question de financement, le rôle financement climatique international. Je vais parler sur une expérience de pôle solaire de Ouerzazat, qui est une expérience importante au Maroc. Aussi, euh, je vais essayer de voir un peu le rôle de partenariat ou partnership public-privé et surtout pour les questions énergie renouvelable et faible euh, émission de carbone. À la fin, je parle un peu de recommandations et les attentes du Maroc concernant le défi d'une façon générale. Alors, pour la vulnérabilité du Maroc, je, vous savez que le Maroc, dans sa position géographique, il est euh, condamné d'être... Euh, sous l'influence de questions de changement climatique et ça se voit surtout sur les questions de ces écosystèmes forestiers et agriculture et surtout, surtout la question de l'eau. Et si on regarde la question de l'eau, on constate que le Maroc, le stress hydrique actuellement, il est à peu près le, le, le un tiers par rapport à 1960. Donc le Maroc, il est, euh, était obligé de, de, de mettre en place 
une stratégie à bas carbone pour effectivement faire face à ces questions de changement climatique. Et c'est basé, la clé, c'est le, le, surtout les énergies renouvelables. Pour les indices du Maroc, comme vous le savez, il a été présenté lors de la COP21 à Paris. Cet indice Maroc il est classé comme ambitieuse. Pourquoi Parce que on a à peu près, dans le cadre des objectifs inconditionnels, 18%. À vrai dire, c'est 13% sans compter tout ce qui est activité euh, relative à l'agriculture, à la forêt et, et aussi euh, aux, aux terres, aux, aux utilisations de terres. Donc, avec, en tenant compte de ceci, on aura à peu près 18%. Par contre, d'une façon globale, on a 42%, dont 20% sont conditionnés par, par euh, l'appui, effectivement, de tout ce qui est euh, finance extérieure et tout ce qui est appui extérieur. Donc, ces 20%, ils peuvent aller jusqu'à 24%, parce que 24%, avec aussi, en prenant en considération tout ce qui est agriculture, tout ce qui est forêt et tout ce qui est aussi terre, donc on monte à peu près vers 42%. Alors, ces 42% pour les émissions de gaz à effet de serre, pour faire face ou pour effectivement être opérationnel, le Maroc a développé à peu près euh, ou a pensé à développer à peu près 57 projets pour l'investissement d'environ à peu près 50 milliards de, de dollars. Dans la partie inconditionnée, c'est à peu près 18%. C'est il compte un peu 251. Euh, tonnes équivalent de CO2 pour effectivement réduire. Et il y a 22 projets avec un montant à peu près de 27 milliards ou 28 milliards. Pour la question conditionnée, inconditionnée, pardon, conditionnée, c'est à peu près 42%, c'est à peu près aussi 35 projets et euh, vers 25,8 milliards de dollars. Donc c'est un budget très très important. Alors, comment le Maroc effectivement compte mettre en place cette stratégie sur quelle base Alors, il a pensé à deux instruments. Un instrument économique et financier, basé surtout sur climate finance, carbon finance, and les, 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 les state budget, c'est-à-dire le budget de, de, de l'État. Alors que pour la question de euh, les instruments institutionnels réglementaires, il a pensé aussi à une politique nationale de changement climatique, aussi de renforcer tout ce qui est cadre institutionnel, on a déjà un projet de centre qui s'appelle 4C, c'est un très grand projet. Aussi la réglementation, le cadre réglementaire avec la taxation et aussi certaines EET. Alors pour la vision des de indices au Maroc, bien sûr il y a la question de mobilisation de fonds. Il y a aussi un rôle très important qui va être donné à la finance climat pour la réduction effectivement de tout ce qui est risque qui sont limités. Euh, très important c'est la question de cette mobilisation des fonds privés pour, un, pour les investissements, les, les fonds publics pour l'investissement de ce qui est privé et aussi les fonds internationaux pour tout ce qui est investissement du fonds national. Alors, l'exemple le plus important au Maroc, c'est l'exemple de World's Asset. C'est surtout le, 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 le grand projet de, de, de plan solaire de World's Asset où il a été mentionné qu'il va passer par quatre étapes. Nous sommes déjà à la quatrième étape, avec, bien sûr, dans un coût général 0,6 gigawatt, c'est-à-dire à peu près 586 mégawatts de, 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 comme potentiel. Aussi, pour le financement de ce projet de World's Asset, on sait euh, il y a un investissement à peu près de 2,2 milliards d'euros avec un financement à peu près euh, multiple, c'est-à-dire à peu près 80% de finances, ce sont des dettes, et 20% c'est à peu près euh, de l'argent euh, interne. Dans cet argent, il y a à peu près 2, 200 millions qui viennent de l'AFD, 200 millions aussi de la Banque mondiale, surtout le, euh, tout ce qui est fonds d'investissement climat, à peu près 3, euh, 830 millions euh, d'euros vient aussi de, surtout de la coopération allemande. Et les autres, bien sûr, c'est tout ce qui est fonds euh, de l'investissement, c'est la, la banque d'investissement européen et les autres banques. 
Alors, bien sûr, il y a d'autres exemples qui ont été vraiment dans le Maroc. C'est surtout l'exemple de, euh, de certains euh, éoliens au Maroc, surtout à Tanger, à Tarfaya. Il y a aussi le plan de Wazazet qui est à peu près euh, aussi dans ce cadre-là. Et aussi, il y a certaines, surtout euh, euh, autres projets comme celui de Ibn Muttahar et aussi le cycle de Tzad Dart. Alors, bien sûr, cette question publique, partenariat public-privé, c'est très important pour le Maroc parce qu'il compte vraiment un, développer ce partenariat pour pouvoir financer une grande partie des, des projets qui sont alloués, surtout aux énergies renouvelables. Les recommandations pour aller directement aux recommandations que le Maroc pense effectivement, c'est effectivement, c'est surtout soutenir le financement climatique amélioré pour les euh, instruments de politique énergétique des énergies renouvelables. Aussi, ces questions de fonds renouvelables ou des énergies renouvelables pour le soutien de l'accélération des investissements. Et aussi pour un peu l'écart de financement et de la composante conditionnelle indiciée au Maroc, il faut les appuyer et accepter aussi la combinaison des mécanismes de marché et de revenus de GCF pour effectivement avoir... Euh, dernière chose, c'est que déjà au Maroc, il y a l'accréditation d'une euh, agence qui est l'ADA, agréditée comme agence pour tout ce qui est euh, fonds verts et fonds d'adaptation. Il y a huit agences qui demandent d'accréditation, ils sont en cours d'accréditation au Maroc. Donc, pour en conclure euh, rapidement, bien sûr, DFI, c'est où le finance d'investissement pour le développement, c'est très important parce qu'il soutient davantage les occasions d'atténuation euh, et, et de, surtout identifiées dans les indices. C'est aussi question de euh, mixer le financement et euh, bien sûr réussir d'autres actions et assurer dans les négociations, surtout des négociations au, au sein des de, de CNIC, des combinaisons de financement entre les mécanismes de Paris et les autres instruments, surtout les instruments bilatérales et multilatérales. Et merci. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that, that a real strong examples you've given there um, of development finance, working with climate finance, working with private finance and with domestic resources. And I think domestic resources are often missed out in these discussions. There are a lot of resources being put in domestically that we that's really strongly contributing to the 1.5. So we'll move on now to, to Pete Betts of the UK government. He's been um, lead negotiator for the UK and the EU for many years and is now head of international energy and climate change at the Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy Department of the UK. Uh, thanks, Alison. And although you wouldn't necessarily know it from the name of the department, we, we are the lead uh, ministry in the UK for climate change. Um, so I'm not, I don't have a presentation because I, I sort of, I was asked if I'd like to attend this uh, seminar. So I said, yeah, that sounds quite interesting. And then I found out I was on the panel. Uh, so, um, I want to say three sets of things. Uh, I just want to say something about the UK's overall approach uh, on uh, climate finance. Secondly, I'll say something about how, in my ministry, we spend our money. I've, I've got about a budget of about, of about two billion pounds, so nearly three billion dollars. So I'll say something about how we spend that. And then I'll say something about how we Uh, try and uh, work with the MDBs, the more sector development banks, in line with the the remit. So, starting on the first thing, you know, the the overall approach by the UK. So, I have to give you a health warning before I say anything, which is that uh, we have an election uh, next month, and that means we are in what we call perda, which means I'm not allowed to say anything controversial or interesting, uh, which is natural for a bureaucrat. That's natural for me to be boring, but uh, we're not allowed to say anything uh, controversial um, until after the election. And of course, you know, we, we don't know, you know who, who will be in power after the election. Um, having said that, um, we have um, the commitment to spend 0.7% of our uh, gross national income on official development assistance written into our legislation. So it's a legal requirement on every government to spend 0.7% of our, of our gross national income on official development assistance. 0.7. Yeah. 
so so that is so the, the the kind of the general requirement that developed countries have signed up to is written into law so you know it's extremely unlikely that uh, an incoming government would change that we haven't seen the manifestos yet so that's a that's that's the kind of base now uh, like all developed countries we our climate finance is part of our official development assistance and different countries take different approaches some some simply uh, don't have a separate fund for climate. We have a separate fund for climate within 0.7, uh, which is called the International Climate Fund. Uh, it's a much smaller share of our overall ODA than other countries, because other countries follow different approaches. Ours is a ring-fenced amount for climate, and it's 5.8 billion pounds over the next five years, which is getting on for nine billion dollars. It's not not quite as many dollars as it was a few months ago, but it's uh, it's about nine billion dollars. So within that 5.8 billion pounds, we took a decision, ministers took a decision very early that we would uh, spend 50% on mitigation and 50% on adaptation. So I don't know if it's still the case. There was a study a few years back that said that the UK was the biggest global funder of adaptation. Um, so I don't know if that's still the case, but it certainly was then. Um, and then within, so we have 50-50 mitigation adaptation and we spend 20%, we aim to spend 20% on forestry, which we count as both mitigation and adaptation. But that's the overall picture. Um, so, uh, and then within the adaptation money is all spent <coughs> by DFID, who are our development ministry, because we share this International Climate Fund out between ministries. And they, they, they are the experts on adaptation. They spend all our adaptation money. And the vast majority, <coughs> the, the, the overwhelming majority goes to uh, these developed countries in Africa because we, we we think we should be driven by need uh, in how we spend adaptation money. On mitigation money, we, we spread it more broadly. <coughs> we do spend uh, a substantial chunk of our mitigation money in middle-income countries, uh, but we, um, uh, we also spend quite a bit in Africa. So I'll say a bit about um, how we, how we, how we, what is our strategy for that? So, two billion pounds sounds like a lot of money, but clearly, you know, when you're trying to influence, you know, investments running into the trillions, both on the mitigation and on the resilience side, you don't just you want to use that money strategically. You don't just want to go for the cheapest reductions of tons on the mitigation side. You want you want to be transformational. So, what does transformational mean? Well, we've tried, we've spent a lot of time thinking about that, but one of the things we try to do, so I think we all know how the cost of renewable energy, for example, has fallen dramatically over recent years and is now cheaper than fossil fuels in many parts of the world. But the problem is with renewable energy, it's capital intensive up front. You spend all your money up front, whereas with a fossil fuel plant, you spend most of the money over the lifetime of the plant on the fuel. So renewable energy projects are very sensitive to, you know, can they, is there local capital around? How expensive is the capital? Is there a stable regulatory environment so that the investor can be confident of getting their money back? So a lot of our inter interventions are aimed at, in different countries, getting over that market failure, trying to reduce the cost of capital, trying to demonstrate to local lending institutions that renewable energy can be a good at good investment, that a country can invest in renewable energy and address their poverty and energy as access needs and grow uh, in a way that is, you know, makes good sense and reduces emissions. So for example, we have a project in, in Uganda called Get Fit, uh, which I think has increased the total uh, generating capacity of Uganda by about 20% by helping to overcome some of these barriers. We have a project called the uh, Renewable Energy Performance Platform, which uh, operates in, in different countries in Africa, which is about 40 million pounds, I think. Get Fit's a bit bigger, it's about 100 million, I think. And Renew Renewable Energy Performance Platform looks to um, uh, overcome some of these barriers using different kinds of finance, guarantees, mezzanine finance, equity, different different ways of and, tech, and capacity building to help countries overcome some of these uh, these barriers so that they can roll out um, uh, renewable energy. So, so that's what so what we're trying to do is to demonstrate that this is possible, so that others will see that they can do this, you know, in the wider economy, and you get scale up. 
Um, another, another feature of our program compared to, say, Germany, which is the one I know best, we do a lot of work with uh, Germany, is that we, we put much more of our money through multilaterals, multilateral <coughs> development banks, as a proportion than do the Germans. And that's partly because the Germans have a much more developed network on the ground in many country, in, in many more countries than we do. So GIZ in particular, but also KFW, you know, has the capacity to operate in on the ground, particularly in middle income countries that we don't have. So we we put a lot of our money through multilateral development banks and we even put money through the Germans, which can be a problem because, um, for example, Get Fit, the project I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, which is a very successful project. We deliver that through GIZ, who are a great partner, but quite a lot of people in Uganda think it's a German project. <laughs> so, you know, that's, and, and it, was, it was interesting, a colleague from Morocco uh, mentioned the, uh, the tremendous achievement of Morocco in, in increasing um, uh, uh, renewable energy there. Um, and mentioned the funding from the climate investment funds. Mm. I mean, we are by far the biggest funder. <laughs> for the climate investment funds but it's it's often invisible to the country and in fact our own ambassador reported back in a dip tell that this was a fantastic investment in morocco that the germans and the Moroc and the french had done and she didn't even know that we had uh, she didn't know that we had uh, uh, we had invested as well so that's a, that's a that can be an issue uh, for us so as i was saying so maybe i'll now come on to to the thing you actually asked me to talk about uh which was uh the multilateral development banks so um you know we you know at the, the 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 relationship with the world bank in our in our government is owned by diffid by the development ministry so it's been a bit of a learning curve for us to understand much more better how the how the multilaterals operate and to make sure we can we can be part of the conversation about how they how they raise their game. Um, I, can't, I can't see anybody's faces, by the way, because the lights behind you, it's a bit like torture. Um, but I just recognized Mohammed there, so that's... Uh, but you've just come in, right? Uh, oh, you've been there the whole time? <laughs> God, did I say anything indiscreet? Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so, I mean, we're, you know, we are very pleased... Thank you very much. We're very kind. We're, we're very pleased that the banks, the MDBs, made the, all made these commitments to state, scale up uh, climate uh, lending uh, in the run-up to Paris, and we think it's important uh, that they deliver those. Uh, we were very encouraged that uh, Jim Kim uh, reaffirmed the commitment to all this uh, more, most re more recently, so that's also good news. Um, one of the things we're trying to encourage them to do, because even if they, you know, achieve their targets, so their share of the 100 billion is what 28, 30 billion, I think, you know, that's that's important, but it's clearly modest in terms of the scale of the trillions of investment that we're trying to shape. So we are, as others are, encouraging them to think more creatively about how to optimize the use of their balance sheets. So can they, and I know this, you know, can they not just do conventional loans, can they make greater use of guarantees, can they, um, can they sweat their assets uh, uh, more more effectively, you know, whilst uh, retaining their AAA status, and there are various studies suggesting they could get quite dramatic increases in lending just by being a bit more innovative um, in that. And actually, I was talking to your chief risk officer recently in the African Development Bank, and he's he's got he's got very thoughtful ideas on this. You know, I think one of the issues for us has been, um, and I'd be interested in people's views around the table, is that. You know the country directors in the world bank you know they will be having conversations including it or, or the african development bank they have conversations with planning ministries finance ministries in in countries i guess represented in this room and quite often climate change neither mitigation nor resilience is mentioned it doesn't come from the country and you can kind of understand that because countries priorities are you know poverty and growth and we all we all get that so what we want is to you know, for a conversation to happen between between the the country director and the and the country to really test <coughs> options where you know the country can do can meet both or all sets of objectives. So not just you know reduce emissions, but also grow and um, uh, their economy and address poverty and energy access also and so on. Which is why you know this insight or this growing economic reality that, for example, renewable energy is actually cheaper 
if you get it right, uh, then fossil fuels is so important. So we need to try and get that into the conversations uh, that the banks have uh, with the country country directors. And, you know, I guess as in our countries, there's, there's an element of educating um, finance ministries and planning ministries about climate change because it's just not at the top of their agenda, as frankly, it's not at the top of necessarily of our, our, of our equivalent uh, uh, ministries. I mean, I'm not an expert on 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 adaptation, and and I don't say that. You know, I, I would like to know more about it. I think it's a core part of any, you know, credible strategy for addressing for the planet for addressing climate change. I think, but I think there is an emerging story there that you know. I think that resilience. I would say most adaptation spending, most resilient spending, will actually be in the private sector. You know, there is this kind of mantra in the negotiations that, you know, mitigation, okay, yeah, maybe that can be private finance, but adaptation is public finance. Well, actually, you know, adaptation is happening all the time in all our countries, and often we don't even know it's happening. You know, even if a subsistence farmer digs a slightly deeper deeper ditch, that's a kind of adaptation <laughs> if the, you know, if the rainfall is not, not coming as often. So, you know, we need to, most of it will happen in the private sector, and it's billions, if not trillions, so it's going to be the private sector. So we need to find ways of making that cheaper. We need to find, as we have on the renewable energy side, and, um, you know, I, th I, I mean, even in the World Bank, this is only informal conversation, so I can't vouch for this, but I think, you know, there was sometimes a perception that adaptation is kind of an extra 20% on an infrastructure project, whereas it, I think it's now emerging, it may only be an extra 2%. So it may be a bit more expensive, but it's not that much more expensive. So we need to think about how we can sweat concession or finance, you know, really as, as tightly as we can to to maximise uh, uh, the extent to which it it can it can it can help. Um, so that's a bit rambling, but I would say, you know, in terms of 1.5 degrees, you know, even for two degrees, we know we're going to have to mobilise trillions, not not just 100 billions, which I agree is a commitment which we we stand by. So, you know, this is about delivering on public finance commitments, but also really getting better at, at driving private finance uh, and, and knowing better how we, how we use public finance to support that. Thank you, Peter. Um, I, th I think there's a lot of c consistency with what Gareth was saying and, and um, the Morocco experience. So I think we're, we're hearing quite consistent messages across here. And anything you, we can do with you to help convince um, finance ministries that climate change is their top, should be at the top of their agenda, uh, I'm sure we'll all help you, you there. Um, so we'll move on to just five minutes each from our two CSO speakers. We'll start with Mutheka and then and then Stefan, um, just to respond to what they've heard and, and maybe prod a little further on, 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 um, on the issues that they've heard. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. And uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank everybody, particularly government uh, 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 representatives who have come to share their experiences with us in this uh, very important side event. Um, uh, the, I, I want to start um, uh, by just a quick background of um, the, the um, the encroachment of the uh, private sector and particular DFIs into the climate change interventions. As the civil society, we have been, uh, PAGJA has been at the forefront of uh, resisting the, um, uh, um, uh, the, the encroachment of uh, the private sector, particularly the banks and the uh, multilateral uh, uh, institutions into, into, into the climate change work simply because the issue uh, looking at the climate change as a big challenge uh, is that um, we the, the, the it, it does particularly the adaptation doesn't have um, the, the return on investment and uh, when you're looking at uh, the, uh, the the DFIs um, the they are, they are profit driving and it, as such, they will not uh, invest in a place where where they are not going to get profit. So that is one. But uh, in view of uh, the Paris Agreement, where the prominence of the non-state actors has really been uh, enhanced, then we we have no choice rather than to look at uh, what role they are going to play. And uh, 
one of the our experiences is that um, looking at the investment, as has been mentioned um, by by multilateral banks, uh, including the World Bank and the African Development Bank, there has been uh, uh, concerns, particularly from the indigenous peoples, that um, the, 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 it, it turns out to be negative, uh, and that um, the issue of free, prior, and informed consent has never been addressed in some of these investments. Um, I can, uh, uh, I've, uh, uh, you may be familiar with some some of the incidences where we, as the civil society, have raised concern with the with the particular investment, particularly uh, in Kenya where um, the, some Dutch, Dutch uh, uh, companies are investing in renewable energy, in wind energy, and uh, they have, uh, they, they, that's, that has led to, into the uh, dispossession and displacement of uh, communities already facing uh, uh, the, the, the challenges of climate change in drought. Um, in in, in uh, Congo Basin, we have got such experiences in forest investment. And so this is quite an important issue where we are really to look at uh, what to be the negative though. Is it going to complement uh, the, 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 uh, the, um, the multilateral climate uh, 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 funds? With like uh, the Green Climate Fund, or is it going to be negative? Um, we, we, uh, looking at uh, really the trend which is uh, really uh, happening, the, 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 the governments, particularly the developing countries, particularly in Africa, we have really a challenge where they don't even care about the people, they, are, they care about profit. So that is quite a, a very serious issue, which we have to confront as uh, the investment by DFIs become uh, prominent in uh, in addressing climate change. Uh, and so, um, we, as the civil society, want to really some guidelines. Do we have really guidelines? Do we have? Are there the the pra best practices? Are there minimal standards which we have really to address? while looking at this investment or it's just investment because now there is an opportunity to for, for renewable energy in a particular country renewable energy in uh, in Kenya in Uganda in Zambia in Gambia and those other countries so this is quite important um i want to just refer to the uh, what's happening in the in 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 the most an initiative which as the civil society we have driven we have celebrated uh, in africa the african renewable energy initiative this was a particular uh, 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 um, uh, initiative which we were really interested in which we have we thought that now could alleviate uh, energy poverty in africa but uh, the, the, the recent developments actually uh, 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 make us really worried whether there is uh, any commitment in, uh, in addressing climate change and renewable energy poverty in Africa. You are aware that uh, as we have already issued a very strong uh, 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 petition to um, to uh, the, 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 uh, um, the, the, the those who are concerned and Already, we have you have seen our the the, the delivery unit om, almost in, uh, in in shambolic nature as we speak now, because now the the European Union, the French government, and those others now are interested to impose and uh, and uh, 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 deviate from the original focus which this initiative was going. So all these interferences and all what is happening really make us worried whether there is any commitment to deliver on climate change and help uh, um, help uh, Africa and those other developing countries in addressing energy poverty and addressing climate change. And as we move forward, we want to 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 be to be sure that um, the investment in uh, in in uh, by DFIs are not going to to lead in maladaptation uh, to 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 plunge communities or end uh, 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 suffering on climate change impact into more poverty into more suffering, and this is quite uh, uh, something which we have to, uh, to be cautious. We have been looking at these initiatives very cautiously, and uh, the, the uh, uh, climate finance uh, should always be addi additional. Uh, it should be uh, over and above uh, ODIs, but this is not what we are seeing. 
uh, after the Paris Agreement, we, we, we designed them to cautiously welcome it, though it was not as adequate as what we wanted. But now the, these developments are making us, particularly in Africa, worried, and we want to see what uh, uh, some guidelines and uh, some standards developed if we are going to ensure that uh, the contribution of D DFIs are going to be positive in addressing climate change and particularly the vulnerable people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Muthika. So it's, it's not renewables at all cost. And I think that's one reason why we've headlined this 1.5 and the SDGs and the closer we can bring those two agendas and driving both together in tandem hopefully um, some of those issues will be better better addressed but i'll move on now to stefan um from climate action network thank you alison <clears throat> well let me talk a little bit about uh, what we as climate action network have been doing in the last couple of months and weeks to address international public funding on um, on energy in particular as regards to ecas um, export credit agencies, multilateral development banks, and development finance institutes. Um, <clears throat> so, um, what we believe as a starting point is that um, if we want to achieve 1.5 degree, we have to phase out fossil fuels rather soon, latest by 2050. Well, of course, there are other guys, other sectors we have to address, but all is nothing, all is nothing without phasing out fossil fuels. This is a scientific set. I think no one is debating that one. Um, so, however, if you look into the overall financial streams globally, then we see that the world is not moving in that direction. We have seen since 2005, 2006, almost a doubling global investments upstream and downstream in fossil fuels last year this was about 1.1 trillion us dollars we've also seen the growth thankfully into renewable energies which was by no means that strong as the growth in fossil fuels so investments in fossil fuels and energy efficiency combined are less than half of the investments in fossil fuels and I must say, most of the investments, both in the clean energy, energy efficiency, and in fossil fuels, most of that, 90-95%, were all private investments. So the private sector is the sector which has to deliver the majority of the investments of the clean energy transition, of the shifting the trillions paradigms, what we have said. They only can do that, and they only will do that, of course, with political framing, with appropriate legislation, but also those who lead on financial streams, who have a broader responsibility, which are the major public finance institutions, which have the mandate to be leapfrogging and have a mandate to drive us out of fossil fuels. In that respect, we believe, and we will come with, as Canada National with a position draft, at least in our community, next week, where we will ask, and we hope we get this agreed among our members, and we ask all financial public institutions, ECA, MDBs, and DFIs alike, to cease any support for fossil fuels. And if you want also nuclear, if I look at the opening the gate of nuclear by the emerging um, uh, um, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, to cease support for fossil fuels and nuclear by 2020, and invest only in the, in the kinds of energy, in renewables, energy efficiency, related inf infrastructure, including public transport, of course, and excess of energy to the poor. That's a fundamental issue. Um, second, <clears throat> this is not about what we have seen, thankfully, in the last couple of, of years by some of the, of the MDBs and IFIs, that there is a move to phase out funding for coal. That is good, and that's great, but it's a first step, because we have seen at the same time a move towards gas. The IB and others are moving more into gas. That's not what we want. That's another carbon lock-in, which the climate, the 1.5 degree challenge, does not deserve. I think we have to be very clear on that one. Um, why I'm saying those issues is, um, if you also look into, and let me shortly talk about energy access for the poor, because that is, as Alison has mentioned in the beginning, is one of the key components and key challenges and key needs to be financed by the MDBs in particular and DFIs. The investments into energy access for the poor 
on average per year, a 13 billion dollar. This is less than 1% of all energy investments, less than 1%. Energy excess um, is a very small proportion of financing within the energy within the with the energy energy portfolio of the MDBs. It's very low. It's less than five percent. This is a complete mismatch, in particular those countries who need the funding for overcoming energy poverty are the potential clients of um, well of those uh, of those MDBs and DFIs. Second, we have seen recently, thankfully, um, that a group of actually 48 countries, very vulnerable, poor countries, 48 countries have approached the target to go to 100% renewables by 2050. That's quite a lot. So MDBs and DFIs have a role to play to help them, support them with all means. The reason why we believe that the MDBs in particular and DFIs have a role to play in that one is to basically phase out fossil fuel investments completely. They deal with scarce public resources. As I said before, the majority, the overwhelming majority of investments is and will be in the private sector. It's a minuscule part of private investment. However, the MDBs, based on their mandate, have the role to steer the change, to lead, to leapfrog. And the private investor, as we know from experience, will follow very often the banks in their investments. If the banks are not going into sectors and areas, the, the public banks, the private banks won't follow. But if they go in that sector, they might follow. We see this with many projects where some of the um, funding was risk hedging by public banks. And then the private equity came in as well. Uh, Public-private partnerships, et cetera, et cetera. It's not happening without the leading and steering role by the public banks. They have the role and I think the challenge to be champions, to create champions and only, and only fund and deploy best available technologies. On top of that one, the multilateral development banks, because they are public, public funded, have somewhat a liability to comply with what countries and governments have agreed in international treaties, such as the Paris treaties, such as the SDGs. The private sector, does not have that strong liability. I'm not saying they go against the law, some do, as we know, but, but they don't have this strong legal link as the public banks. So if we don't get the public banks to steer the way out of fossil fuels, the private sector will not do it. And I think that's a political implication um, we have to make and make the public banks, including the AFDB and all of those, to be a champion and a leader on only investing in the most clean, and clear technologies, which would ex exclude fossil fuels and nuclear. Thank you. Um, thank you, Stefan. So we'll move on. We've now got 30 minutes left, and I'd like to open the floor to, to you, um, to the audience, um, for questions and, and short interventions. Please do keep your, your interventions short and, and to the point. And, and if you have a particular um, pan panel member you want to answer, please, please do say. So please do let me, if you have. So we have, can, sorry, can I also have someone um, with the roving mic here? Uh, you'd flip the switch up. Is it, is... Also very nice to use the box. It makes it very interactive. Oh, does that work? Is that a yeah. speaker? Does that, do you check it works? Okay. It does. I have not yet. Okay. Um, oh, Lena's good. going to use the box. We'll throw it. So there's a lady at the back. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, um, thank you. Thank you. There was a proposal published. Can you give your name? Can you oh, give sorry, your name yes. and um, uh, Vanya Walker Lee from the Nature Trust Malta. Uh, there was a proposal last week issued by a British economist. I can't remember his name, but you will know, Alison, that the world's central banks should create a three hundred billion dollars uh, a year quantitative easing on the world scale and this money would be used to buy green bonds which would be allocated to clean energy and other related climate change uh, projects and activities uh, any member of the panel what do you think of this idea i'll take one or two more than that so we've got one in green bonds yes and Yes, we've got one in the front here. Please give your name. <laughs> okay, thank you for your wonderful presentations. Uh, I just wanted some clarity from uh, Peter Betts. 
Uh, you had a wonderful transition trying to create feeding tariff systems, two billion pounds per year across a four year period. And you managed about 700,000 homesteads uh, with renewable energy, solar energy. And there is a campaign to stop that subsidy, that cooperation. So what is the latest in that direction? Are you still funding the homegrown renewable energy sector or you have put a stop to it because of the politics and the lobbies that is going on? Uh, for you, sir, uh, thank you for your presentation from African Development Bank. Uh, your safeguards, the way you presented it are very wonderful. But the specifically the area, African Renewable Energy Initiative also have some safeguards on environment, on social, uh, with the ultimate of generating electricity. Uh, it's not clear at the moment uh, where decision lies, uh, whether it's with your safeguards or with the safeguard of area. Uh, in view of the 19 projects that have just been screened, uh, area is against mega dams and you don't seem to oppose mega dams, for example. So perhaps uh, there's need to harmonize uh, these safeguards uh, to prevent uh, the kind of situation that we have seen uh, from the board. So uh, I think we need some clarity also on the role of the bank, uh, whether you see that uh, area as a, a basket fund that you have a leverage or you are just holding that fund in trust. Thank you. Okay. Your name? Uh, my name is uh, Godwin Uji Ojo, Environmental Rights Action, Friends of the Earth, Nigeria. Thank you. I think I think we'll do, we'll um, we'll take those are three questions there, which I think I'll I'll put to the panel. And um, Vanya, I'm interested in this concept of green bonds, and and maybe one or two of the panelists can talk to the quality of green bonds and whether they are actually developing the le the level of it, of uh, and the quality of projects that we want to see. So um, I'll, I'll start with Pete, and I'll move along, and and anyone wants to in some specifics there, but we will also move on to the more general questions. Um, we maybe extend the, the safeguard question across the pan the, the the table as well. At least, at least with this, I don't have to catch that. Um, so I warned you at the beginning I would have to be boring. So I, I'm not going to comment on the uh, on the uh, central bank's $300 billion proposition. Um, just on your question, so about the um, domestic UK policy. So again, I have to be very careful because we're in Perda. Uh, I don't know what the position of an incoming government would be. But it, it's not it's not the case that we have stopped um, subsidies for renewables. So what we what the government did was to reduce and phase out uh, funding or subsidies for onshore wind and for solar, uh, and focus uh, subsidies in the future on offshore wind. Uh, we have I think I don't know if this isn't still the case. We have more offshore wind generating capacity than the rest of the world put together in the UK. Because, and that is, I mean, offshore wind is much more expensive. It's much further from being at grid parity. Uh, so there's a much stronger case for subsidy with this, this technology. Uh, whereas uh, onshore wind and solar are much, particularly onshore wind, are very, very close to parity now uh, with, um, with fossil fuels. And in fact, um, a, a month or two ago, we had in the UK our first day where we had all our electricity generated from non-coal sources. We didn't have any coal electricity for the first time since the 19th century. So, you know, sorry? Oh, sorry, I thought, some, thought, we, were, thought we had a heckler. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so, you know, we, we also have this commitment to phase out uh, coal by 2023 or 2025. So it's not true that we've we've uh, uh, phased out subsidies for renewable energy, but we have reduced them and redirected them. 
Uh, thank you very much. On the um, the question on the green bonds, um, uh, I think I think it would be very interesting uh, to see such a proposal. Uh, I think Alison uh, sort of made made raised the point that it's the quality of the projects that we feed into the green bonds. Uh, and uh, I mean, green bonds typically we've seen uh, they tend to focus very much on emission reductions uh, and, uh, and and therefore on the energy sector, which I mean, in the context of our discussion here, is good. Uh, but you know, the concept of green green growth and so on goes way beyond. Uh, just climate change, um, and, and you, I mean, you can look at climate change as an as a as an effort to manage one particular resource, which is atmospheric space, uh, and how we use that. But there are many other resources that uh, we also need to use carefully, uh, but they don't get the same level of attention uh, as we uh, as we, we we give to climate. Um, so, but I think it, it would be very interesting to see such a proposal, and uh, 300 billion would be a material amount of money uh, that uh, you know that could make a very uh, a very uh, send a very good signal um uh, godwin on your question on ari i've noted it down i don't work uh, specifically on ari i'm afraid i don't know the details and um, so i'm not able to to really respond to that but i've noted it down and i'll i'll raise it with one of my colleagues uh, who's more engaged on that thank you Not really. It's not really my area at the minute. I mean, I know we we, we do have the safeguards. I mean, I I also noticed um, or noted the the, the point uh, around sort of the the potential for maladaptive projects and uh, and and uh, you know activities that uh, you know that that don't necessarily engage fully with uh, with consultation and so on. Um, I think sort of in response to that, uh, you know, definitely we are committed to work to address poverty and uh, and and climate change, and, and we want to do so through using uh, you know clear stakeholder consultation processes and so on. And one of the mechanisms uh, that we are currently working on, on developing is uh, a mechanism that we're calling an adaptation benefit mechanism, which we're proposing under Article 6.8. Uh, of the Paris Agreement. In fact, Uganda has picked that up and submitted it into the negotiations. And that is about, um, uh, I mean, in, in a nutshell, it's it's about taking some of the elements of the clean development mechanism and putting those into a mechanism that would reward the private sector for getting engaged in adaptation um, and providing a price signal in the same way that the clean development mechanism provided a price signal to get the private sector engaged in mitigation activities. We think we could do a similar kind of thing for adaptation. And that would also involve uh, safeguards and uh, and stakeholder consultation and so on in, in the same way. I mean, of course, it will uh, uh, there'll be challenges as well, but uh, but but we're very keen to um, to work to address those. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to respond to the green bond issue. Um, I think, um, well, <laughs> green bonds are a mixed basket, as we know, and they have different definitions and different concepts. We have seen last year in China, on one side, thankfully, the Chinese um, financial institution and the government launched a huge approach to new uh, green bond scheme. However, if you look what is in the green bonds, it includes uh, nuclear and clean coal, what they call clean coal. I don't think that's the concept we want. Um, however, my, my, my intervention is not related to the green bond thing. I think the key issue is how do we channel money, resources, technology, knowledge into developing countries? In particular, I think with, with what is the role of the development fund, financial institutions, and the MDBs. And, and let me recall that although we have seen growth in renewable energy investment significantly, it's less than 10% less than 10% of all renewable energy investments, which went into, into countries outside the OECD and outside the basic countries, which is basically Brazil, South Africa, China, India. And the rest of those below 10% goes mainly to a handful of countries like Chile, Morocco, Abu Dhabi, Mexico, and Argentina. The rest of the countries, which are the vast majority of countries, mainly LDCs, mainly on the African continent, has a minuscule investment to in, in compared to total, both public and private, um, into, into renewable energy, if you want. And I think this is what we need to change. We see changes in some of the more richer countries, um, including some of the emerging economies, but we do not see the necessary change, the flow of investments, for various reasons, into least developed countries. And that's, I think, where the role of the MDB is, with or without green funds. Show us a way, work with the governments, prepare the framework, for that one, um, generate the governance and generate the trust for shifting the trillions because those are the regions where there's a dire need for energy. We heard about energy, energy poverty in those countries. This is where the money 
from multilateral development banks and development financial institutions in the sector of energy should go. Sorry, yeah. Um, well, um, just a fine comment is that um, there is need to balance between um, uh, profit and in, uh, um, in, uh, investment and uh, the uh, uh, compassionate duty by uh, these institutions to ensure that they are addressing a particular challenge of climate change to the vulnerable communities. Um, as Pagja, as uh, uh, under the African uh, Coalition for Sustainable Energy and Access, we are we are developing a set of uh, of um, of, of um, uh, safeguards, which are going to ensure that uh, the the uh, uh, DFIs adhere to the best practice and, uh, and 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 the minimum standards, and we hope this is going to be adopted within a serious regulatory framework, which is going to ensure that uh, we we address the issues of climate change with uh, the transition to low carbon development pathways, uh, climate resilience, and uh, without compromising the quality uh, of life of the people. So that is quite important, and we hope that um, some of these emerging initiatives will be able to develop, to adhere to such safeguards and ensure that uh, this doesn't plunge the people into, into further suffering, those who are suffering from climate crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we'll move on to some more inputs from the floor. We've got this lady here first and do put your, up your hand so I can see. Um, um, okay. Ronnie Cohen from the Ministry of Environmental Protection in Israel. I have a question for the speaker from Morocco. You mentioned the accredited entities. That are, uh, How many are already established in Morocco? And how, how should I say, how Energy, human energy intensive it is for these entities to apply to the Green Climate Fund for, fun, for, for funding projects. And do you understand the question? Yes. And um, for the African Development Bank, the tools, I think I missed at the beginning, but the tools that you mentioned, are they already the tools that you use for assessing projects? and? And just out of curiosity, how many projects <clears throat> has the bank invested in together with the Green Climate Fund in the past year? Do we have more um, questions on the floor? So we have one, uh, the lady at the back. Thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm Julia from German Watch, um, and um, I uh, thank you very much for all your very insightful presentations. Um, I got a specific question to Mr. Phillips from IFDB. Um, so you presented the different elements to deliver uh, on climate change mitigation and adaptation as the IFDB. Um, how would you address the issue that uh, if, for example, a gas power um, plant would be compatible with NDCs, but still not with the overall 1.5 degree goal. Um, so how, how would the bank deal with this issue? Thank you. Ooh. Do we have one more from the floor? Before? <laughs> Any more questions from the floor? We'll take one more. We'll, we'll have a, a further round after this, but not for now. We, we, yeah, go on. I just, I just wondered. It's just very, very much a, an open question. Where do people stand on hydro? Uh, because it was referred to, you know, because hydro is, you know, arguably very low carbon. I know there are questions about methane emissions, but I think it's now um, suggested that they can be quite modest. But clearly, there can be big social and, and other implications of, of large hydro. So I'd just be interested in where the banks banks are on that, because you often hear these huge numbers of potential in places like the DRC for, you know, 100 gigawatts of, of energy, which sounds very exciting, but I'd just like to understand where people are on those on those difficult choices. Can I, can I answer that question? Because it's something I used to, in a previous life, be much more involved with, and obviously there was the World Commission and DAMS that made their recommendations on how you assess 
large hydro, the, the, the banks haven't adopted, they've ad adopted their own guidelines, which um, many of the people in this room, I think, would have a lot of concern that they're not thorough enough. And I think our criteria would very much be is how detrimental are to people? Are the displaced people sufficiently remunerated? Which the, the problem is, the experience is no. They're not well remunerated, they're not looked after, they're not consulted. And um, without really strong guidance, we say no to all large hydro. It, it's quite blanket because the experience is very negative and we've not seen sufficient movement. The other side is obviously the, the local environmental impact, and that depends on the head of height. Congo's got very high head, therefore a, a smaller dam area. The assessment would still have to be done, but that's very different to something in Latin America where it's a sprawling dam. So the, 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 each one is different, but the experience we've had has been very negative, particularly for local communities, local environment. And I think the, the more you can do to push those standards up, it, the more acceptable, or the, at least the more acceptable to the local family, communities, local countries, that, that there has been true involvement. The other question in that is it's another mega project putting billions into one big project, which would be, you know, Inga Dam would send electricity to South Africa and the big industries, not to communities. So it diverts money um, from the smaller access projects and money from the diversity of projects that are local, secure. Um, not resilient. So that's that's another issue that I've come across in terms of the dams. So there, the, I think that it's very. I think actually, sorry, I'm taking this a little bit because a bit of a high horse of mine. Um, but it, it's it's very easy for the MDBs to put big money into big projects to get big outputs because again, it's efficient to get money back. What we need to do is develop new products that put big money that can be efficiently put into lots of small scale, diverse solutions. So the efficiency of the, the spend is, is improved in there and that it's, it's easy. But, and then you've got multiple suppliers rather than just one big project. And I think that's a huge challenge to the banks to be innovative in how they invest and one of the challenges across these issues. So uh, from my perspective, that, that, that would be my answer on that one, taking my um, chair. So I think for the other questions, uh, we had a couple, but well, for specifically for, for Morocco one and um, for the Africa Development Bank, that, um, so if you can come back with that. Si, si j'ai bien compris ta question, c'est que il s'agit... I can try to translate mm -hmm. if you want. I can use the box. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So okay, okay, okay. Donc, euh, historiquement, le Maroc, il a déjà une agence qui est accréditée pour le fonds d'adaptation. Il so a déjà... Make a little... Uh, be brief. So, uh, historically, uh, Morocco already has like an agent that is uh, working with the adaptation fund. Et cette même agence, elle est accréditée maintenant dans le cadre du fonds vert pour... Le climat. The same agency that is also accredited with Mais fund. on a huit entités qui se sont proposées pour être accréditées. Ils ont mis leur dossier pour l'accréditation. And there are another eight, uh, which you can see on the screen, um, which are currently in the process of being accredited mm. to the Green Climate Fund. Et, et si vous avez regardé, il y a aussi des banques. Il y a deux banques. Il y a euh, Mazen qui est déjà une agence de, qui est responsable de tout ce qui est plan solaire du Maroc. So you would have like um, two banks in there. Mazen is one of them, which already have like, uh, like yeah, solar Mais il y a aussi l'agence marocaine de euh, tout ce qui est efficacité énergétique et énergie renouvelable. Donc ça, c'est aussi, il y a aussi une institu institution des énergies. Donc deux institutions, SIE et l'adhéré, ancien adhéré, la met actuelle, ça montre que le côté énergie renouvelable, il est très euh, demandé au Maroc, il y a beaucoup d'entités de, qui travaillent sur eux. And then you would have like two um, like entities who uh, have a very strong um, energy portfolio, which are currently trying to apply as well. Et une grande partie, une grande partie de les indices au Maroc compte beaucoup sur la question des énergies renouvelables. C'est pourquoi on a effectivement énormément d'entités nationales qui se proposent pour être accréditées dans le fonds vert. Okay. 
Yeah, so if you look at the Moroccan NDC, it relies uh, hugely on uh, developing the renewable energy portfolio. And this is why um, actually the entities um, that are currently in the process to apply um, also have like a similar portfolio. So. Dernière chose, c'est l'agence ADA qui est entité nationale, c'est aussi, il y a d'autres multinationales qui ont des projets pour le Maroc, pour effectivement... le, le, le le, le Fonds vert climat, et le Maroc vient d'avoir deux autres projets, oui, dans le cadre des multinationales. So there are also other multinational... Uh, multinational... Uh, multinational. Yeah, um, banks. Oui. The dog. <laughs> Sorry. Um, anyways, I zoomed out a little bit. Um, but, uh, <laughs> because I was thinking about something that you were saying. Um, but... Um, yeah. Can you repeat just last sentence, maybe? Donc déjà, <laughs> il y a deux autres projets que le Maroc a eu dans le cadre du uh, okay. Fonds Vert qui sont dans le multinational. So there are already two projects that are in uh, the pipeline for the Green Climate Fund from Morocco. Okay. Uh, Gareth, there are a couple of specifics. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so, Ron, you asked about the tools that we have. Uh, are they already in process? So, two of them, the, the, the Climate Safeguards uh, Screening Tool and the uh, Greenhouse Gas Accounting Tool are, are operational and we're developing the... Uh, the climate tracking is also operational, but it's not it's not really well applied at the minute. Uh, and we're developing uh, our understanding around uh, sort of the, the human side of, of adaptation. So that's work in progress. Uh, and how many projects with the GCF? We haven't yet submitted any projects uh, to the GCF pipeline. We're building up our, our, uh, our pipeline and getting that ready. Uh, and although we're accredited, uh, like most institutions, we haven't yet signed the accreditation master agreement. Um, so that means even if we did have a project approved, we wouldn't yet be ready to draw down funds. Uh, Julia, you asked specifically about uh, if we had a gas-fired gas power plant that was compatible with the NDC but not with the 1.5 degree goal. Uh, it's a bit of a cop out, I'm afraid, but uh, the, the African Development Bank is technology neutral. I mean, we respond to demand from our regional member countries. And, you know, so if they say that this is what they want to spend their ADF funding on, then that's what it gets spent on. Um, the the way that the only way that we can address that is sort of through public pressure on board members uh, and uh, and on you know on the recipient governments, uh, you know, to, to get them to move a, a away and uh, and you know raise their ambition and so on. So we can't really uh, you know we can't really sort of force the issue on that. Although as I explained, the tools that we're developing and particularly this greenhouse gas accounting tool uh, will help to identify the liability that the country is taking on and hopefully shine a spotlight on the fact that in you know in the example you've you, you you've given uh shine a spotlight on the fact that this particular asset would compromise the 1.5 degree goal and it would help us make that argument uh, and on the uh, there's the, the the hydro issue um because i mean there are a number of of, of mega hydros that are uh, that are sort of uh, under discussion and um, i mean i think i agree that the clearly you know the social issues the displacement issues and so on are critical and it's very uh, it's very important that we work hard to get those right that we need good standards and so on um uh, to just to to note really the 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 positive aspect of uh, of hydro of course is that it provides baseload energy um and if we need if we have to look at renewable or, or new technologies for baseload then we have hydro uh we have geothermal which uh, is a, a resource that's available in africa and can be exploited more and we have storage and we have various different storage technologies you saw in waza's art in uh, in the presentation from morocco that is a concentrated solar power project so it stores some of that energy as molten salt um, and you saw on the slides that um, currently it can store some energy for up to three and a half hours and that will move up to, to seven hours in the second phase but it's quite expensive uh, to do that and the you know the amount of energy that can be stored is uh, you know not enough to run industries um, and uh, then of course the other source of energy storage is battery technology which is coming on rapidly uh, and um, as the costs of that come down um, you know, it it might cut, get to the stage where it becomes attractive to store renewable energy in batteries. Uh, but for Africa, baseload supply is important, so we need to find it somehow. And just on the this sort of this thing about sort of the, the mega projects and and not and avoiding this diversity of smaller projects, I want to come back again briefly to this adaptation benefit mechanism. It is a new product. It's a it's an innovative proposal, and uh, that is a mechanism uh, that it wouldn't be implemented through the banks uh, because um, you know. It, but but 
it is a way that we could stimulate a lot of small projects uh, and support uh, small and medium enterprises in Africa, as well as, as larger projects uh, to, um, to get engaged, a way of channeling climate finance in, a, in a, an efficient and transparent manner uh, to, uh, to projects that deliver a wide range of adaptation benefits. I have some flyers on that if anybody would like to know more about the adaptation benefit mechanism. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take uh, one more round and then but we'll start with Lena. You, you don't need to, you can throw it in there and catch it if you like. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot, uh, Lena Dabak from Climate Action Network. Was, um, I have a very quick question and, um, uh, and on, the, on your last point you were making on uh, the technology um, neutrality, I think, I mean, we heard some interesting legal interpretation like the other day and I'm, I would be interested if there is actually I would argue that uh, gas is not actually like a technology. I mean, I think it's infrastructure for uh, something. So maybe there's an, a loophole that you could explore like as a bank, like if you have such a, um, yeah, projects in pipeline. And, um, and then my other question, huh? No, but this process uh, clearly spoils you. Um, and then I have, um, yeah, like uh, I, I think your suggestions, um, that you made like to to work with the board members i think that's um very interesting and it would be very help uh, it would be very helpful like um yeah to to maybe work on a common strategy we currently work like um try to work with countries on their national um lending strategies and it's obviously interesting to us like on how we can be more supportive and yeah getting also the yeah whatever we uh, discuss here off the ground so further discussions are very welcome thanks i think comments there rather than uh, <laughs> the questions to be answered is there any burning question there now move to very final comments uh, if there's anything else the speakers want to Shall we? Yeah. Okay. So, if, if any, don't feel you have to. Um, we, you, a lot of you, spoken a lot, but um, we'll, we'll start at the end. This end, just sort of closing remarks if you want to make them. Thank you. Merci pour la. Merci pour la, la qualité des présentations, mais aussi pour les, les, les questions. Et j'espère que l'objectif est atteint d'après cet atelier. Merci. Thank you. <laughs> Finish? Finish. Oh, OK. <laughs> Mine is just to say that uh, DFIs are a new phenomen phenomenon in climate finance. But we have to handle it uh, very cautiously, ensuring that uh, we are, and bearing in mind that we are addressing a very, very delicate uh, uh, financial stream. And uh, 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 to ensure, as I've mentioned again, that um, this is just not conventional kind of financing. It is financing to address a particular challenge, which is affecting the most vulnerable people. So once that is done, we have to address the issues of safeguards uh, uh, to ensure that uh, the, we do not uh, um, exceed the limits where we are going to, uh, uh, this is going to lead into maladaptation. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, for CAN, I think um, we um, <clears throat> we repeat that our long-term vision is 100% renewables in the energy sector. For that, we need to address probably the harder power question. We need all renewables to supply that. And we need also harder power. It needs to be sustainable, of course, socially um, adopted. Second, um, I think we have to combat the um, and challenge the issue of low carbon. And gas is always referred to as part of the current uh, portfolio of the MDBs. Is concerned as low carbon. No, it's not low carbon. It's only low carbon if you compare it to the, um, to the bottom, to coal. It's high carbon if you compare to renewables. So there's a, there, it's, it's a value judgment if you say low carbon. And it is not carbon neutral. I haven't come across um, technology neutrality in the banks, to be honest. I haven't talked much to the AFDB, to be fair. But I've seen in banks many, many officials in the bank under the, under the umbrella of technology neutrality strongly defending investments in low carbon fuels and gas in particular, but it's not technology neutral. Thank you.
Uh, thank you very much. First, I'd like you to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present uh, today. But I wanted to leave you with a question. It went back to actually one of uh, the points that Stefan made uh, earlier in his intervention was around uh, and, and, and relates to, to Pete's intervention as well, around the difference between climate finance and development finance. And uh, one of the questions I often get asked about adaptation is how do you distinguish adaptation from development? Because good development addresses adaptation issues. And for me, this raises the question then, well, how do we separate out development finance from climate finance? Uh, and, you know, do we need to recognize that in due course, uh, you know, these two will run together or are we always going to try to keep them separate? I don't have an answer for it. I think it's an interesting discussion. Uh, and um, I just wanted to, to raise that because it was sort of relevant to some of the comments that were made. Uh, but thank you very much. And I'm happy to stay after to talk. Uh, well, very briefly, um, so, so it's a very good discussion. Thank you for inviting me. I, I agree with what Gareth just said, and I think it's an important point. And I, I do think that this point that most adaptation and resilience spending is going to be happen in the private sector is an important one. And I think it's a neglected area. I think a lot of the intellectual effort has gone into thinking through the private, how you mobilize private finance for mitigation, how you mobilize private finance for resilience is an un under investigated area and we need to improve our understanding. Thanks. Um, just wanted to thank the audience, particularly those who are online and listening, where you're not forgotten. And can we just um, say thank you very much to all our panelists for a really interesting discussion there. Yours? No, it was from down there. Oh, right, yes, sir.